as touching kingdom service and kingdom responsibilities, there are two things that are very prime. Number one is faith. And number two is faithfulness. Faith is your ability to believe in God. Why faithfulness is a place or a state where God can believe in you. It takes your believing in God to work impact. It takes God believing in you to commit things to you. There are many people who are full of faith. They don't have character. They don't have integrity. They are not sincere people. They are not reliable. And so even though they have so much faith, God can't trust them. The Bible says, I the Lord, I search the heart. I test the reins in order to give to every man as his way should be. So the position you occupy with God is that place of trust where God can commit things, kingdom responsibilities to you. And then I said the second thing that gives you relevance in the kingdom is the grace that you can host, the grace that you can handle. Because everything we do in this kingdom is by grace. And so if a man is not growing in grace, he may not really, really be relevant in God. And then finally, I said, what gives you relevance in this kingdom are the things that happen around you, the possibilities you can command. And that's why I told you men are not the same. What we can command are different levels. And so when you come to a conference like this, primarily speaking, what you are looking for is something beyond the sensation. It's something beyond the excitement. It's something beyond the enthusiasm. You want to apprehend more of God. You want to apprehend more of grace. And you want to leave the conference and begin to work greater operations of the Spirit as touching kingdom advancement. And so in order to delve into these realities, we decided to examine the scriptures. And yesterday, one of the things we were able to touch extensively was the place of honor, was the place of discerning those who carry certain possibilities in God. And these things are very important. They are very important because you don't stumble on spiritual realities. You grow into them. Most of you seated here today, you don't need anybody, literally speaking, to do anything in your life. You can provide for yourself. You can shower. You can buy what you want. You can go where you want. But it was not always so. There used to be a time in your growth process where somebody had to brush your teeth. There used to be a time where somebody had to decide what you wore. There used to be a time where somebody gave you what you ate. My son is six, seven months old. If myself and my wife are not there in 24 hours, he will die. But a time will come when he may not even reach out to us for months. A time will come where we may not see him for years and he will be doing well. But until that time, he will need us to take him from one level to another. To move him from one level of growth to another. That's how it is in the kingdom. And that's why in teaching on this subject, migrating from one level to another, I told you the first thing that we make for your genuine progress is your discernment of those who can help you. Your discernment of those who can lift you. A time will come where you will do business directly with the world and with the Spirit of God. But until you get there, you will need somebody to shift you from one level of glory to another level of glory. And the truth is that we are not the same. There is somebody who has something that you don't yet have. And so I was teaching you yesterday, I told you, in order for Elisha to become a relevant prophet, God had to send Elijah to him to shift him. But a point came where God took Elijah and Elisha was making progress. But there was no way Elisha would have started like that. So God had to send somebody else to activate him and to raise him up. And I told you the same thing about Paul in the New Testament. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 1, Paul said to Timothy, he said, the things that you have received from me, he said, the same commit to faithful men. Paul speaking to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 14, he said the grace that Timothy carried was a function of the laying on of his hands. And so everybody making impact today, once upon a time, 
connected to the graces in others. And that's why the Bible admonishes. He said, be ye followers of them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. And I remember telling you humorously yesterday how some young people come to some of us and ask us questions like, who anointed Elijah? They ask us these kinds of questions. And I told you, these things are possible. But you need to understand that you don't formulate doctrine from hidden part of scripture, silent portions of scripture. There are descriptive scriptures that give you narrative of things that happened. There are prescriptive scriptures that suggest to you what you need to do. And there are didactic scriptures that commands you to do certain things. The Bible says, be ye followers of them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. That's a didactic scripture. That scripture is superior to a silent scripture that you don't know the foundation. In fact, Paul was teaching in 1 Timothy 1 verse 4, he said to neglect fables and endless genealogies that minister question rather than godly edification. So some of these hidden portions of scripture that journey from one question to another question is not what you want to build your life on. Because the people you are referring to, those that rose after them, they imparted them. And the Bible teaches and instructs and commands that we should follow people that carry certain graces so that we too can obtain the promise. You don't want to spiral your life into a gamble by trying to live your life from a silent portion of scripture. That's foolishness. That's arrogance. That's pride. And so I said it's important for you to discern graces and connect to those graces. And I remember sharing with you yesterday that this is not something that is a sole prerogative of the fivefold ministry. By that I mean it's not just apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers that you connect to. There are certain graces that are resident with elders working amongst you. They may not bear the title of a bishop, but when you look at their lives, there are certain possibilities that they carry. That's why I told you the relevance of a man is also tied to the possibilities that he commands. And so when you look at a man and you see that he commands certain possibilities, then it should be obvious to you that that man carries a grace. And if you want to make progress, you've got to discern that grace and connect to that grace. It will make your journey easy. Don't be part of the rebellious generation that feels nobody carries anything special. That feels we are all equal. We are not all equal. We have never been all equal. Study from Genesis to Revelation. God worked with certain men in certain dispensation. It will be foolish for you to come in the generation of Abraham and say we are all equal. We are not all equal. It will be foolish for you to come in the days of John the Baptist and say we are all equal. We are not all equal. Jesus said of all men born of women, there is none greater than John. We are not all equal. And so you must make it a point of duty to discern graces and connect to those graces. And in order to make the teaching functional, I showed you four ways of connecting to graces. Number one, I say it's by honoring them. Whatever honor means to you, apply it. And you will see that the grace will begin to find expression in your life. Honor the bearers of the grace. Not because they are perfect, necessarily speaking, but because there is a glory trapped in this man. He said, we have this treasure in 18 vessels. So they are always 18 vessels, but there are treasures in them. And so when you discern them, honor them. And as you honor them, God will see your heart. And on the strength of your heart, God will take that grace and place upon you. Number two, I say when you discern bearers of this treasure, serve them if God sends you to them. In serving them, you become a partaker of what they carry. It's important to understand this. This is what makes a man to tangibly walk in a dimension. If you don't serve any grace, you cannot be qualified to host it. Because you don't even know how it works. If you study the early church, there are four forms of leadership that exist in the early church. The first form of leadership 
that exist in the early church is called the apostolos. And the apostolos are those God sends to open up territories so that spiritual realities can begin to find expression. That's why they are called the sent ones. The second form of leadership you find in the early church are the elders. And the elders are defined in twofold. There is what you call the episcopus and there's what you call the presbyters. All of them are elders, but they are just being defined by what they do. The episcopus are the elders that play the role of overseeing. That means the administration, the leadership, the coordination of the church is resident with them. So they are called the episcopus. And then you have the presbyters. The presbyters are elders in that they are without blemish. They've come to maturity so they can direct the body of Christ and decide on matters of leadership and governance as touching the body of Christ. And the fourth set of leadership you find in the early church are the diaconates or the deacons. And so you have to serve before you become an elder. And so in the early church, they ordain them to, the, to be deacons so that they can grow into eldership. Because if you don't serve a grace, you will not understand the place of consecration. You will not understand the sensitive requirements of graces and anointings and your heart will not be humble enough to bring leadership to others. Neither will you understand the place of love in leadership. And so many times when God wants you to be accurate, he will insist that you serve somebody else before he can bring you into full empowerment. And so I say when you find a custodian, what you do is that you serve if God is leading you to them. And I'm using that word consciously because you can't serve everybody. You will serve the one God is leading you to. And so when God leads you to a man, pay the price to serve. There are many things that you will find. There are many things that will happen to you. So long as it's in the path of righteousness, keep serving. And I told you according to scriptural injunction, the number of years, least number of years to serve is seven years. Because if you have not labored for seven years, you don't qualify for rest. The number seven is the number of completion. And then the number eight is the number of a new beginning. And so when you have served for seven years, a door opens to you. That's why every time completion is achieved in scripture, number seven must be in view. God walked the world for six years and the seventh day, seven day he rested. Praise God. Jacob served Laban for seven years to receive a wife. A slave is a slave for six years. On the seventh year, he has the liberty to buy his freedom. And so you've got to serve for at least seven years. It will take time for you not just to touch a grace, but to master that grace. We are an ambitious generation. Everybody wants to become popular overnight. That's why we come under pressure and we become fake. Because by the time you discover the responsibility that is put on a grace begins to come upon you and you don't have what it takes to defend it. You will now begin to cut corners in order to keep that motion going. But when you have mastered the grace, every responsibility that comes is an opportunity to showcase Christ. However, if you have not handled the grace when responsibilities come, you will discover your emptiness. And because of human pride and ego, you want to keep it working as if all is well. And that's why you find men cut corners. That's why you find men becoming fake. That's why you find men doing all kinds of things because the grace is actually not there. Now they have become too popular for the grace they carry. They come to a place, thousands of people gather. They have become too popular for the grace that they command. They come to a place, they bring the blind, they bring the deaf, they bring the lame. They come to a place captains of industry show up and they don't have the word of the Lord. A great man shows up hoping that because of his popularity the word of the Lord will be with him and then he comes to ask him for direction and suddenly he discovers that the word of the Lord is not with him. And so what he needs to do now is to create some form of rituals and bring all kinds of manipulation to, 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 to meet up the demands of the moment. He comes to a place, they bring the sick and everybody wants him to minister to the sick hoping that with this level of popularity there should be an answer to this crisis and then when you show up you discover he's empty 
And because he will want to do something to make it look as if it's well, all kinds of manipulation comes. That's why you start hearing of bogus encounters, massive exaggeration to make it look as if something is happening. But ideally, nothing is there. Manipulation. Because we didn't master graces. We went out in a haste to create impression. If you want to make impact and not create impression, you have to master the grace of God upon your life. And one of the ways to do it is to serve the people that are in those spiritual tribes. Number three, I said the way you build into a grace is to give to it. Not because you are buying it. It's a token of the heart. It shows your admiration. It shows your appreciation. It shows your overwhelming, you know, bewilderment at the expression of God through a man. And one of the ways you show your love for something is by giving to it. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave. The giving in this context is not an attempt to buy the grace. If you attempt to buy a, a grace with money, you are cost. But you can love a grace and admire a grace and sow into that grace. You can love a grace and admire a grace and give into the labors of that grace. By doing so, God sees your heart. And what God does in return is that because you have loved and admired so much, God allows it to begin to rub off. Because that is a sign that you honor that grace. He said, honor the Lord with your substance. When men honor things, one of the ways they show honor is by giving. Not an attempt to buy. There are many people who carry huge sum of money to give to people who have grace, hoping that they will buy it. You can't buy it because even the man can't give you. It's God that takes from the man and places upon you. If a man can give grace, I assure you, their biological relatives will be the only ones having it. If a man can give the grace he carries at will, it's his wife and children that will manifest it more than everybody. But many times a man is carrying a grace, somebody who is not connected to him by blood at all is the one that carries it. Because the man is not the one in control. God is the one in control. But there are indicators God sees. When God sees that you admire and you love so much and you honor it, God will make you become a partaker. This is what Paul taught in the book of Philippians. He said, concerning giving and receiving, he said, no church related to me on this matter, but you only. And there are two things Paul said in that book. Number one, he said, you have become partakers of my grace. How did they become partakers? Because they honored that grace by giving. He said, only you interacted with me by giving. He said, you have become partakers of my grace. And Paul will go further in chapter 4, verse 19 to say, my God shall supply all your needs. Grace inclusive. Because they honored the man with their substance. The Bible said in Matthew, I think chapter 10 from verse 14 to 42. He said, if you receive one of these in my name, you have received me. He said, if you give to a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. If you give a cup of water to a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. And I told you the Bible used the cup of water because it's not talking about an attempt to buy it. That's why the value is not in what you gave. The value is in your heart posture. A cup of water can provoke something much more than a million dollars. Because one may come to buy, another may come to honor. And so what God is weighing is not what you give. It's the heart posture. Does this heart honor this grace? Is this an act of honor? When the, the, the witch wanted to buy the grace of God from Peter, he said, your money perish with you. You can't buy the grace of God with money. But you can honor the grace of God with money. It's a scriptural principle. And then finally, I say, when you find the grace, pay attention to it. When God sends you to a grace, pay attention to it. And I showed you from scripture, Philippians 4.9, how to pay attention to a grace. Learn from it. Hear it. See it. And obey it. That's what Paul told Timothy. He said, the things you see me do, the things you learned, the things you heard, he said, the same do. So if you don't learn from a grace, if you don't listen to a grace, if you don't see a grace consistently until it comes to a point where you begin to do, you have not paid attention. And if you don't pay attention, you can never carry it. Many people are just shuffling through the internet. They look at this, look at that, look at that, and they hope they can carry. It doesn't work like that. Sir, 
for you to handle a grace, you will sit on it for a long time. You will give your time, you will give your energy, you will give your commitment to that grace until it dominates you. That's how you receive grace. And that's why I told us that one of the undoings of this generation is the fact that they don't sit enough under any grace. And so people are not being discipled. A lot of people are aware of things. They are actually not being discipled because they can't sit anywhere. Especially those that begin to see little, little things happening in their lives. You find somebody singing because one or two persons talk about him. He can no longer go to church consistently for three months or for four months. One Sunday he's here, another Sunday he's there, another Sunday he's there. Some even go to two, two churches in one Sunday. They enter this service, the moment they are done singing, they are on their way to the next service. One Sunday, he's in three different churches. That's why you begin to find, hear things that should not be said. Because the soul is empty. The energy of God is not there. The character of God's spirit is not being formed. He's jumping up and down after a while. Ministry becomes about honorarium. Ministry becomes about fame. They never sit anywhere. They never serve anywhere. And so they never get built up. Never get built up. You have to take root before the stem and branches come out. If the stem and branches come out first, that tree will wither. The slightest warfare will wither that tree. And that's what happens to a lot of people. There are many young ministers today never served anybody. Because they say, Jesus, two people fall under the anointing. They are all over the place. That's why people wither away. People wither. I was trained. One of my major trainings was in Christ's embassy. As far back as 2009, we were seeing people fall under the power. Nobody knew about us until 2017. When I was serving in Kano State, we were pioneering sales in Kano as far back as 2011 in Wari, in uh, a full, um, Bukavu Barracks, relocated to Wari in 2012 in a and places like a Furum Barracks were pioneering sales everywhere. Nobody knew us. People just jump up. They think it's about popularity. They are not established. And so you can't trace them. You can't trace any reality in them. Before I came into the apostolic move of God, I was still underground for like seven years. Nobody knew me. After pioneering churches, I, when I came into the apostolic move, I was an MC. When they have a program, they will call me to come and introduce guests. I will introduce guests, go and sit down. My job is to make sure in the course of the introduction, bring some life. So I will use words, make people laugh, make, say some things. When I create an atmosphere of joy, I will go away. If they have a program anywhere, I show up with my bow tie. I was MC for five years. After pioneering churches. Nobody cares what you have done. They want to check the character of God in your spirit. But you see, this generation where everybody, there's nothing wrong with evangelism. From the day you give your heart to Christ, if you understand the message of salvation, you can start doing evangelism. But it doesn't make you a five-fold minister. There are two different things. And so we need to pay attention. If you say you are following somebody, find out his process. Find out his dealing. Find out his covenants. Find out his consecration. Those are the things that make you. Not to start talking like him and dressing like him and acting like him on the stage. That's, that's caricature. If there's no strength in the spirit, that's a joke. Today you find somebody jump into a prayer house 
He starts praying the way the person who is the lead person is praying. And because he prays like that, him too has become an apostle. It's a joke. You jump into a place, you find a man dressed in a particular way, talking in a particular way, you start dressing and talking like that. The next thing you are an apostle. <laughs> That's why there will be many fakes in the nearest generation, in the nearest dispensation. Because people are not being discipled. I'm telling you, if something drastic doesn't happen, and if teachers, teaching priests don't show up to correct some of these overbloated errors, in the next five years, seven years, if you hear the word apostle, you will tell them to get out. Because scandals would have broken out everywhere because babies in the things of the spirit will discredit and bring reproach to the name of God and so in order not to bring reproach to the name of God it will be better these things are re-examined again to be better they are re-examined before you become bold to say certain things Make sure your secret life is in alignment. If you are not strong enough to, to sustain secret purity and consecration to the demands of the spirit that powers you, don't even start anything. Because you will just make a mess. Paul gave a commandment to say, exhort not a novice. When, he's, when he becomes popular, he said he will fall into the condemnation of the devil. Somebody starts preaching because he has a page. He's talking to the body of Christ. You will hear somebody giving a message to the body of Christ. You are not afraid of calling the body of Christ. How many years have you served the body of Christ? Do you know the body of Christ? You gave your heart to God, to Christ, three years ago or four years ago. You are talking to the body of Christ. How many years have you served the body of Christ? What do you know about the body of Christ? <laughs> where, where can they trace your service in the kingdom to? And for how long? Can your character be proven? How many places can they go to and prove your character? You are addressing the body of Christ. God himself has not even sent you to the body of Christ with signs, proofs. You create your page and then you begin to address the body of Christ. Why not even wait for the body of Christ to ask for the grace on you first? We are in a situation. We are in a dicey situation. While God is setting men on fire, empowering men and ordaining men, there has to also be the line, the caution, the cautionary line to guide people in discipleship until they grow into maturity to be able to handle kingdom responsibilities. Because if we are not careful, we will mix up the place of guidance with God raising men and the line should become blur. That the moment men are called, they will not wait to be sent. Because Jesus in Mark 3.14 called them to be with him so that he might send them. Not all were sent eventually. Paul was writing in Romans 16 verse 9, it says, Salute Junior and Andronicus. He said, they were in Christ before me. And he said, they are men of reputation in the apostolic community. But they were not sent to the body. They remained in the church and they were growing there and mentoring other disciples. Praise God. Ah! Well, we have another session. So let me just explain two things. I took time to, to explain to us how to receive grace from custodians. I said, number one, you do what? Honor them. Number two, you do what? Serve them if you are sent to them. Number three, you do what? Give to them. By faith, and by the leading of the Holy Spirit in love. And number four, you do what? Pay attention. Pay attention. If you do this, 
something genuine will work in your life. The second way to access and to walk in the grace that shifts men is by the world. Remember, when I started sharing, I told you that there was a time where you dependent, depended on your parents, your aunties for everything. Right? To brush your teeth, to dress you up, to give you food, everything. And then there was a time when you came to a level of maturity and you could do certain things for yourself. In your work with God, you will not always depend on men. You may always and you should always have men to guide you, to oversee you. You can even grow to a point where you are the oldest believer and there's nobody again to be your father in the Lord. You will still have an accountability group among your friends who fear God, who can rebuke you, who can correct you. So that you never overgrow oversight. You never overgrow coming under authority. Nobody overgrows that. Are we together? However, as you begin to grow, a point comes where you too have to begin to do business with the word of God. Because there are certain things that you must find from the world. God will never allow somebody else committed to you. Because that will be irresponsibility towards the world. The Bible said that in Proverbs chapter 4 from verse 20. It said, my son, attend to my words. Give thine ears to my sayings. It said, let them not depart from thy heart. Put them in the midst of your heart. He said they are life to them that find them. And health to all their flesh. He now said when you put them in your heart. He said now guard your heart. With all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. So there are certain issues of life. That comes into your heart. Because you have interacted with the word of God. And so everyone who wants to enjoy a genuine undeniable irrefutable proof in shift or movement in the spirit must become a student of the world if you don't have the word of god in your spirit you will really not enjoy a shift that can be sustained genuine shift sustainable shift come by the instrumentality of the word of god and i share a few scripture with you the first way to enjoy a shift by the world is to be saturated by the world. If you want to enjoy a shift by the world, you will be saturated by the world. If you are not saturated by the world, you can never enjoy a shift by the world. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual song, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Now, he said when you are saturated with the word, he said, a kind of wisdom begins to work in your life. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let's celebrate Pastor Owe Abut. When you are saturated by the word, there is an unexplainable wisdom that begins to move your life forward. And remember, it said true wisdom is an house built, And by understanding, it is established. And it said true knowledge are the chambers filled with all precious things. So the wisdom that moves men forward comes when they start getting themselves inundated by the word of God. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, it said this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein for then thou shalt make thy way for then for then when it has saturated your heart when it is constantly on your lips he said for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and have good success that means prosperity and good success which is also Shifting from one level of glory to another is a product of saturation with the world. There are many persons 
who have never found anything in the world. There are many persons that have never touched something in the world that has created a shift in their life. The reason is because they are not saturated. When you are saturated with the world, you begin to think the world. You begin to talk the world and you begin to act the world. You are not saturated with the word because you can quote one or two scriptures. No, make no mistakes about that. You are saturated with the word when you think the word, talk the word, and act the word. This will be so spontaneous that it's not something you are planning to do. When a circumstance confronts you, the word of God jumps out. And so what you need to do as a man who genuinely wants to make undeniable pro progress is to sit on the word eat the word feed on the word until your mind is conditioned to think the word until your mind is conditioned to act the word until your, your mouth is conditioned to speak the word this is what brings promotion in the kingdom there are many people they hear one scripture that a pastor they love quoted and they start quoting it you can quote it and impress people it doesn't mean you are going forward you go forward because the word carries you forward in first timothy chapter 4 verse 13 14 and 15 this was paul speaking speaking to timothy remember paul had already imparted timothy but paul knew that there is a place that only the word in you can take you and he said until i come give attendance to reading to exhortation and to doctrine he said neglect not the gift of god that is in you by the laying on of my hands and then he went further to say when you do this he said your profiting will be made manifest to all that means you begin to make progress that cannot be denied there is a place of my impartation on your life but over and above that you must give attendance to reading to exhortation and to doctrine that's what makes your progress obvious to all men there are many people who are running after men they carry their bag, they clean their shoe, they lie in front of them, and that's all they do. You can't go far in life. In addition to honoring men, you have to have a place with the world. Listen to the disciples of Jesus. They served the master. They didn't serve another man. They served Jesus himself. They didn't meet a prophet. They met the Lord of glory. And when Jesus finished training them for three and a half years, hear their verdict in Acts 6 4 they said it is not meet for us to give ourselves to tables they said we'll give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the world they knew that in addition to working with a man no matter how powerful he is if you don't have a relationship with the world you go nowhere if people who work with Jesus we need to sit on the world which prophet is that which apostle is that that you think he's talking to you or imparting you alone is enough you are not ready to make progress in life. If it is a genuine progress you are looking for, you must get to that point where the word of God begins to move you forward. Paul came to a church that himself found, founded. A church he pioneered. A church he mentored. This was Paul's statement. In Acts 20, 32, he said, I commend you to God and unto the word of his grace, which is able to build you. See, I have trained you. I have discipled you. I have imparted you. But listen, there is substance that builds men. It's not the apostle. This is the wise master builder talking. Paul made a statement, bold statement. He said, I'm a wise master builder. A wise master builder comes to a people and is telling the people, in addition to all you have learned from me, he said, you have to be connected to the world. He said, the world is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance amongst them which are sanctified. An impartation won't give you an inheritance. An impartation can activate a dimension in you. But what will give you your place in time and eternity is what you caught from the word of God. Because heaven and earth will pass away. But not one jot, not one tittle from the world shall pass away. I can tell you why many believers don't make genuine progress. I can tell you why many believers are frustrated in life and they have situations happening around them that they can't explain. And I'm not just talking about believers, including pastors. Forget the coordination. Forget the packaging. There are many people who are confused and stranded. They are just going forward because they don't know what else to do. They are just going forward 
because they can no longer turn back. But when you ask them, there are a thousand and one questions in their lives that they cannot explain. And most times, the reason is because we don't make progress by the world. You can connect with a man and use politics to go ahead. When you come there, you will discover there are demons there. Because every level has demons. It has responsibilities and it has challenges. So forget this gullible principle of telling you, try to connect to a man. The man will move you forward. If you don't have the inner capacity, every progress is a setup. Do you know what it means? People tell you about somebody giving you his credibility. Somebody approving of you. Somebody announcing you. If you don't have the word, run from that announcement. Because the moment the city knows you, all your flaws will come on the scene. There are demons that will excavate your secret mistakes. And you will be cut off. The, your generation will not just not remember you. If they remember you, it will be for reproach. Because a promotion without capacity is a setup. So before you go and stand on that altar and allow that man say, this is an apostle, make sure you have the capacity in your spirit. Before you allow that man announce you and say, this is the next businessman, make sure you have capacity. Before you allow that man say, this is the next prophet over the east, make sure you have capacity. Because the moment Jesus was announced, the devil showed up. If you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. It was no longer the announcement he was using to fight. The announcement actually would have been a setup if there was no stamina. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. It became a battle of words. There are many people who are cut off today because they were announced. Not because there's anything wrong in the announcement, but because there was no word in their spirit. Because the moment Jesus is announced in the Jordan, the devil will come in the wilderness. Because from the Jordan, it's not a palace. From the Jordan, is a wilderness. And when the devil comes, he will fight your understanding in the spirit. If you are the son of God, turn these stones to become bread. If you don't know that man shall not live by bread alone, you will want to show the devil that you have power. And in showing the devil that you have power, you become the slave of the devil. That's why you see some people, they move from announcement to reproach. They move from announcement to fall. They move from announcement to defeat because there's no word in their spirit. Paul mentored the church, but he said, I commend you to God. And unto the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance amongst them that are sanctified. Your inheritance is tied to your revelation. Your inheritance is not tied to a man. Your inheritance is tied to how much word you carry in your spirit. The reason many are weak, frustrated, and vulnerable is because they have no word in their spirit. I think I will stop here this morning. So that we will go and rest and prepare for the evening service. We hail you, Most High. We hail you, we hail you. this morning listen I used to be everybody's favorite until one day somebody made a mistake and called me an apostle and he didn't stop there he made a mistake and made a statement that for the first time somebody has been able to walk in this dimension immediately in less than two months accusations 
allegations, lies, and set up came from everywhere and every quarter. All of a sudden, when I was the MC, nobody was offended. I was a clown making people laugh. But the day the announcement came, the announcement came with warfare. The things I didn't say, suddenly, I, they became things I said and nobody cared to ask me. I suddenly became a black sheep because the announcement comes with battles. I'll be gisting with my friends. They will record it, go and edit it, cut off things and reprogram the language and say what I didn't say and submit to different quarters. Growth is not fun. Growth is warfare. And for you to survive it, you must have capacity in your spirit. The reason God doesn't want to leave some of you is because he's saving you. That's why when God wants to help you, he tells you, go and sit on the world. Because if he lifts you up, what will come, you can't stand it. You want a shift? You must drink the word. You must eat the word. You must think the word. You must talk the word. And you must live the word. Sometimes, for you to cross over to the promised land, you will go through the Red Sea. You will need words. Sometimes, to receive the mantle, you need to go through the Jordan. You need words. The true insurance of a man is the word of God that is in the spirit. Sometimes the people God used to raise you, they are the ones the devil will go and create an unre... Oh man, you don't know the battles in the journey of growth. Sometimes your helpers, those who God used to sow seeds into your life, when you looked helpless, they supported you. The day God raises you up and say, enter destiny. Those are the people the devil will use to cut off from your life. And then the man who on a monthly basis comes to support you with money will suddenly cut off. The only helpers in your ministry cut off. You won't know what you did. The senator will no longer take your call. The businessman will stop giving his tithe. Meanwhile, you were going into ministry hoping that with this tighter and with this giver, they're out. <laughs> That's when you will know that the Bible says, Woe unto him that put his trust in the arm of flesh. If you don't have a word in your spirit, you will be stranded many times in life. Because your helpers will neglect you in the day of your manifestation. Until the word is proven. It is from that word that your sons will be born. It is from that word that your helpers will be born. It is from that word that your support system will be born. That's what three real capacity in the spirit represents. That a man has so much word that he has become like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. Can you ask God this morning? The capacity to stand in the day of trouble. He says, if you faint in the day of trouble, it's not because God is not there. It's because your strength is little. That means many fail and God couldn't help them because there was no strength in their spirit. You will not fall in the day of trouble. Ask for strength this morning. We worship you. We hail you, Most High. We hail you. We worship you. 